Hey guys, and welcome to a new video. In this video here, we're going to do a walkthrough of my master thesis. So I just recently finished my master's in advanced robot technology and my master thesis was about AIs. So let's just start, let's just jump straight into it. I have the PDF file here of my master thesis. So the title of my master thesis is Transformers for Time Aware Decoding of Monkey Brain Recordings. So I actually had a data set available with monkey brain recordings. And then the basic idea is basically to predict the actions performed by the monkey, record those neural activity from the monkey, and then we're going to like decode the signals and also then do predictions of the classes or the tasks that the monkey is performing with the transformer model. So we're mainly going to focus on the transformer model and also the intention mechanism. So that's the kind of like the idea behind this model thesis that I've been doing. The last three to four months were actually like full time on, on this math thesis, so I took it over a year. I'm also going to create a separate video where we're basically just going to talk about like how can you structure your math thesis, how can you write a good math thesis and just a, a technical report in general. So yeah, let's just scroll down to it. I have the abstract here, so I'll just like have it here so you guys can like read through if you want to or like just pause it. This gives a pretty good understanding of like what we're going to cover. So again, this project and paper, it deals with transformers and the intention mechanism for time aware decoding of actions from monkey brain recordings with multiple channels. So I actually have 192 channels from the monkey brain, which is divided into three regions. So it's like the M1 region, PMD region, and also the PRR region. Those regions are mainly, uh, mainly for performing tasks with like the motor cortex. Um, so basically like motor movements, but also planning of motor movements. I have 2,705 trials in total for a data set, and then we have eight classes that we want to do predictions on, which I'm going to show in just a second. I have some visualizations about trial setup and so on, and also the data set. We can see here that the transform model acts like achieves a pretty good validation accuracy of 83 to 84% with a fairly low loss, which is significantly better to the other methods that I'm comparing it to. So yeah, that is an overall like overview over this paper and also my, my project for my math thesis. Here we have the contents. We're going to cover that way more in the, in the future. But again, I have the introduction, some, some basic theory about like monkey brain regions. Then we're talking about like the mon monkey experiments and also the data set. So first of all, it makes sense to introduce the data set, um, the data set structure, and basically just how the experiment has been formed in the trial setup. Then we have the data set analysis, data set, um, data set structure, then we introduce the methods used, so the main transformer model and also the attention mechanism for a neural activity. Go over the basic theory about the transformer architecture, also the modifications that I have done. So I'm actually using a, a weighted a double encoder based transformer model. So we have two encoders in that transformer, which is concatenated at the end with a weighting layer. So we learn like a weighting of what do we pay more attention to because we both have time-wise information and also channel-wise information when we're talking about multi-channel neural activity. Then I have something about like training these transformers here to classify the monkey brain recordings. We're going to see some of the results, also the attention, so we can directly visualize the attention scores, the attention weights when we're training these transformers, so we can visually see what they are tending to and what they're learning in the input sequence from the channels. Then also have a section here about like long short long short term memory, so LSTM model for neural classification, just for a comparison. So this is the main model that I'm comparing the transform model to. Then we have the results where we're comparing the methods. We're going to look at the results. We're also testing the individual brain regions. So as I mentioned, we have three different brain regions, and then I basically just like um, I basically just took subsets of those, like the whole data set with all the three brain regions, but then just for the individual brain regions, just to see and test how much information is actually like stored in each individual brain region. And also if we're able to do classification on um, the individual brain regions, I know that the brain regions are like talking together, but as we're going to see in the attention maps, they act like t attend more to the neurons within each brain region. After discussion and future work, conclusion, and then also the references at the end. I'm going to publish my, my paper and also this report, so you'll be able to see down in the description. I'll probably also like have my uh, my template to Overleaf, so I'm using like tech to actually like write my reports. I've been doing that throughout my whole university degree. So we start to introduce the project here. We have some bullet points here for the most uh, most important parts that I'm going to cover throughout the report. So these are like the requirements that I set up for acts like doing uh, during the project. So it was more in the project description. So the main part of this project is processing of the monkey brain recordings for channel selection and data simplification. 
the missionality production of brain recordings with deep learning techniques and the attention mechanism, predictions of actions for the monkey with time-aware decoding, with the use of transformers, and then reduction in impact of variations from day to day in neural recordings. So the last point here is actually like very important because one of the main problems with neural activity and recording like neural activity with devices is actually like that the brain changes a lot over time. So one day the brain is in like one configuration, the next day the neurons are actually like moving around all the time. So the longer, longer time between each trial or like each day, the more variation you will have in your data set. And my data set here is actually like trials with the span of a year. We also talk about like some EEG data compared to some other models like KNN, SVM, LDA, decision trees, um, some of the classical methods for like machine learning. Um, so some of those are acts like linear methods where when we're talking about like deep learning transformers and those things, uh, we have this non-linearity. So yeah, let's scroll down a bit further. We have the monkey brain recordings. This is basically just like a drawing of the monkey brain. We have the PMD region and one region and then also the PRR region. So the PM, PMD region here is actually like more taking um, taking care of planning the movements. The M1 region here is the main like primary motor cortex and it is a crucial part of um, basically controlling the movements of monkeys and also in the human brain. So when you're actually like performing movements, it is primarily the M1 region where the PM, PMD region and also like PRR region um, is a bit more for planning. The PRR region is also for initiating movements. Let's scroll down a bit further here. So now we're going to talk about like the monkey experiments and also the data set. So this is basically like the experiment setup. We have a monkey here performing different kind of like actions. So we have four light sources in the front and four in the back. And then we basically have a starting position here and we also have like a visual cue. So once the monkey gets a visual cue, it will basically just perform the action. One of the light sources will light up and then the monkey has to reach it. The four light sources in the front, the monkey can reach that, those from the starting position, wherefore like the far away targets or like the light sources far away, it acts like has to move before being able to reach the light sources. So this is like the timeline. We start the trial, the monkey will be in position, it gets a visual cue, it goes. Then we also have like a movement onset when it acts like starts to perform the movement. We have the target reach, trial end, and then the monkey will receive a reward. It, when it ha has actually like performed the task. So this will be the timeline for a single trial. And then we have like 2,705 of those trials where we basically just divide those into our different tasks performed. Here we also have like a graph of like the day-to-day -day variation in the neurons um, over the number of days. So here we can see like the days between sessions and number of match or like the percentage of match neurons in the data set. The more days between the sessions, the more variation and like the more uh, the neurons have actually like moved from day to day. We can actually like see this some kind of like a linear correlation between like the number of days and also the number of matched neurons in the data set. So this is a really big problem within like both human in brain interfaces, like just brain computer interfaces in general. And that's what I'm trying to like tackle with this attention mechanism and, and also the transform model where we go in and do some modifications uh, just to see if the attention mechanism can actually like learn to attend um, to the most important neurons. Maybe they're not changing like that much from day to day. Here we are just having like the channels. We have 32 channels for each hemisphere of the brain. Here we have an action potential. So it's basically just like how our neurons are firing. And then we also have like a time window here. So this is basically what we're going to feed into the model. We have a time window from signal one to signal two. So this could be like a visual cue or the movement onset. So once the monkey gets the visual cue, it will start performing the task and we're going to record the data within that time window. And then we're going to divide it into actually like bins. So we'll both have like a bin size and then we'll also have a window. Within each bin size, we're basically going to count like how many spikes do we actually like have, basically just to discretize um, the number of spikes and so on, and also be able to do spike sorting. So basically just have the spikes here over time between two signals and that will be your data set and the data that we're going to feed into our model. This is how the data set looks like. This is basically just four or five channels. So this is just the five first channels in the data set. 
We can see here we have the red box, so that is the time-wise information. So it's basically just all the samples uh, throughout the whole time window. We also have the channel-wise information, so that will be all the channels um, where we just have like one time step for each. Then we're going to have a transformer or like an encoder block for each of these, um, each of these like both the time-wise information and also the channel-wise information. Of course, they're overlapping a lot, but with the time-wise information, we can basically just pass in the whole time step once where like for the channel wise we're going to pass in just a single time step and then all the channels at the same time so the data will act like be able to overlap but as i'm going to show you we get better performance when we actually have this double encoder compared to just like having a single encoder for the channel wise information and then just passing in everything into parallel into the transform model so that is also one of the advantages with the transform model um, is that we're able to pass in the data in parallel we see we have the data set structure. The data set here is really important to understand to be able to understand the math visits here and also the results. Then I just did like um, a simple data set analysis with some basic statistics. So I also divided my data set into two different data sets where the data set act like starts when the movement onset. So when the monkey act like starts to perform the movement and also one data set where the, the data set or like where the time window starts when the monkey got the visual cue from one of the light sources. And I'm just doing some means here and also some standard deviations just to see like how much how much variation is there in the samples for each class and also for all the neurons. So this is basically just you can go in and take statistics along each axis for the data set depending on like what you want to like take a look at. So now we're going to do, introduce the transformers and also the tension mechanism for neural activity. I'll just scroll down to the model architecture. So this is basically just like all this, the standard like theory behind the tension mechanism and also the transformer. I have courses about that where we actually go in and implement these transform models from scratch and also the intention mechanism. I also have this course where we do like the research implementation. So we basically just learn how to read research papers, like how can we get the most out of it the, the, the fastest. So basically like how can you skim through uh, research papers? We're going to have the code on one side and then we're going to have the research paper on the other side. Then we're basically just going to convert the code or like the model architectures from the research paper that directly into code implement everything from scratch. So if you're interested in that course, definitely check it out. I've, I used this a lot in my math phases and you could probably also use that positional encoding. And this is like the overall architecture from my model or like the, my transform model that I've been using in my math phases. So we have the brain recordings. We start with a linear embedding. Then we will have positional encoding because we pass in everything into parallel or like in parallel into the transform model. Um, so basically we need to keep track of the position of our input embeddings and all our input embeddings or like the whole input sequence we have is basically the, the time-wise information. So all the samples for a single channel or the channel-wise information with all the 192 channels um, along one dimension. So the difference between these two inputs to the model is basically that just that they are transposed. Then we have a transform encoder for the time-wise information and a transform encoder for the, 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 the channel-wise. And here we have the time-wise. Then we take the output and learn a weighted concatenation. So we're basically just concatenating the results from the time-wise encoder and the channel-wise encoder. And then we learn like how much do we actually want to weigh uh, one over the other. I have a linear embedding or like a linear layer here before we have a softmax active activation function to get the class probabilities so we can go in and predict the action that the monkey has performed based on the input to our transformer model. We have the tension scores here. So this is how you can calculate the tension scores, both the tension scores, um, the positional encoding, um, the main architecture is act like the exact same as in the attention is all you need paper from 2017. This is what is inside uh, each uh, encoder. So both for channel wise and the time wise information, it is the exact same encoder. So we have our self self attention mechanism down here with our multi head attention where we can have like multiple heads to learn different kind of like features in our um, input. We have the residual connection, addition, and also normalization. I should probably have tested out with normalization uh, before the multi attention layers and also before our feed forward network. So again, this is just a simple standard feed forward network with a couple of hidden layers. I should have done the normalization be be before the feed forward network and also the multi head attention. Um, reason like research has shown that it acts like improves the training and also the results at the end by doing the normalization before passing it into. Um, the multi attention and also our feed forward network but this is the architecture that they used in the original attention is all you need paper 
I tried it out with some auto encoders for channel reduction. So again, we just have like all the 192 cha like um, channels um, as the input, 192 neurons. Then we have a code vector. So we basically just try to like lower the dimensions to 80 neurons instead of 192 without losing too much information. So that is the encoder. And then we also have the decoder, which basically tries to like reconstruct um, the output or from this code vector or like reconstruct the input from this code vector. So we take the 80 neurons and then we'd have our decoder. Then we try to reconstruct our 192 neurons. So this decoder side here is act like only used for, for training. So again, we basically just want to minimize the loss based on our reconstruction. So our reconstruction or like our loss will basically just be a reconstructed uh, result subtracted with the input. Then we get the loss and then we want to try to like minimize that loss. So the loss is decreasing over time. If we have a loss of zero, like this code vector here would act like be able to, to reconstruct or like represent the 192 channels here uh, perfectly. That is not the case. But again, if we just have like a slight loss or like a, a really low loss, we can actually like gain a lot by only having like 80 neurons as the input to our model compared to 192. Sometimes it also helps with overfitting by act like using like dimensionality redux reducted um, inputs. And then the idea behind this autoencoder is that we want to have the autoencoder here, or like the encoder side, act like just encoding it into eight neurons. So we have this code vector. Then this code vector here will then be the input to our transform model. So this is basically just like another layer in, in between, or like basically like do uh, pre-processing to our model. So this will just be like the first layer before we pass it into our transformer model. Then I basically just did some training, like the standard training method, um, doing high parameter tuning, testing different kind of like model parameters, both for the dimensions of the model, number of hidden layers, um, number of query keys and values, a number of encoder blocks, number of multi-head attention layers. Also, if you want to use masking or not. So one of the good things about transformers is that we can test if we want to use masking or not. So basically, if we want to look into the future, so if we take the whole time window, do we want to take a look at the whole time window um, the whole time? Or do we act like only want to do predictions on past data? So this can be used for different kind of things, but this is also really good where we can just set a single flag and then we can test out different, uh, the two different like approaches. Some training, high parameter tuning, epochs, batch size, learning rate, um, optimizer, and so on. So this is just like the standard training loop. I just had the training, so it's describing the training, the training graph. So here we can see the training accuracy and also the validation accuracy. So because we have so much variation or like variability from day to day in our data set, it acts like starts to overfit like pretty early and we can tune a lot of the data set parameters, tune a lot of the model parameters, high parameters for a training loop and so on. And in all the cases that I did, it was basically like overfitting all the time. So you can't really like do too much about that. Um, the models are just like heavily overfitting. It could maybe be reduced a bit more if we like had a large data set, but it is really hard to get like neural recordings from monkeys. But these results here are not like too bad. The convergence values here for the validation accuracy um, is the most important one. Then we also have this attention for the brain channels. So here we can see the attention maps. So these are the, ex the exact like attention maps. They're, they are just extracted directly from the training. So we get the attention scores um, between our queries and our keys. And to the explanation of the query keys and the values, which is an important thing in the attention mechanism, is basically like if we have some values, some treasures behind some doors, then we'll have some keys that can unlock those doors. And then the queries will tell us something about like which key should we actually like use to unlock the value behind the door. And that is kind of like the intuitive understanding or explanation uh, uh, behind like how these query keys and also the values work. So the values will be our like kind of like attention or like what we want to achieve. The keys will be like how we unlock it and queries will tell us about like which key should we actually like use to unlock our value or find what to pay most attention to. So here we can see that the model or like the attention mechanism acts like tends to attend more to its own brain region. We can still see that it communicates. It acts like still has activations between the brain regions, but we can see that it is mainly communicating and attending to its own brain region and the channels in, um, in, in the near regions or like the near channels uh, to itself. This is like around 33 here and also at the end, it is exactly like the M1 region. And this also makes sense because this is the attention map um, after training on the movement data set. So we can see for the movement data set, when the monkey acts like initializes the movement, 
um, it pays more attention to the M1 region, which also makes sense. So uh, these attention scores here, the attention weight map is really good to try to understand how the model acts like learns and what it pay, pays more attention to in your input sequence. So these are really good to visualize and it's basically just extracting like matrix and then you can visualize it with matplotlib. I did the exact same thing here with the visual data set where we don't have like that much information. As well as you're going to see, we won't get as good predictions on the visual data set compared to the movement data set because it is a bit more noisy for the visual data set because like first the monkey gets the visual cue and then it takes some time before it actually performs the action compared to the movement data set. It just performs the action and we record the data directly from that. So for a visual data set, it will probably make more sense to look at like the visual brain regions compared to that like motor brain regions. Here we can see some of the results. We won't dive into that. The confusion matrix here looks pretty good. We can see that um, that it, it is actually like significantly better at predicting the, the light sources here in the front, which also makes sense because the monkey only has to like just sit there and then just perform the action. And then we can see that the model acts like has a harder time acts like predicting these targets further away because there's a lot of things going on. The monkey is actually like moving and then the, the tapping movement is actually like just a small part of the whole movement towards that target. So that might explain why some of these, um, why some of these in the confusion matrix, it is not that good at predicting the far away targets. Also, if we look at the data set analysis in the start, um, we could also see that there's a lot more variation in the four, four like last classes in the data set. The autoencoder with the, uh, here we can see the trans tra training loss for our autoencoder. It converges fine. It also ends up at a pretty low value. So we're actually like able to go from 192 neurons to 80 neurons and still be able to actually like train our models and learn something from that. The confusion matrix with the autoencoder, we can see that it actually like improves, uh, improves it a bit here, improves it a bit for the for far, for, uh, far away targets. Compare it with the, uh, an LSTM model. So we won't really go into details with that. We just have a standard LSTM cell and then just a prediction hit on top of that. Um, so again, standard model that we're comparing it to. Here we can see the long short-term memory cell. This is actually like what's going on inside of it. So we both have the forgetting state, input gate, cell state, and also the output gate. So it basically just controls like what do we actually like want to forget and what do we want to like keep in memory of our input data. Here we're passing it in sequentially. So here we can pass it in parallel. So we just take like each individual like time step or each individual channel and then just throw them into this long short uh, term memory cell in, in a sequence. And then it will basically just learn what to forget and what to memorize from that input. We did kind of like the same training procedure. Here we can see the LTM brain, uh, brain decoding results. So we can see that the, the LTM model here, it didn't really like learn anything. It is old fitting like way more. The training accuracy is pretty accurate, but the validation accuracy is just way off. The confusion matrix also looks very, very bad for the LSTM model, even for like the first four classes in the front, which was really good with the other two. And here we can see we also get some false predictions for like the faraway targets. So before it was actually like pretty good at its thing where distinguish between like the, the four, four first classes and the last four classes, where here like sometimes it acts like things that um, it is the far away targets when it was acting like the close targets, which is not good at all. So we also compared it to a simple multi-layer perception, perceptron, where we basically just have the prediction head, a really, really simple MLP, just for the sake of trying it out and just seeing if we're actually like able to perform some predictions and actually like be able to achieve some accuracy just from a single like standard MLP. And, it, and the complexity of this model here is really low. So if we're able to just do like some uh, predictions, it might actually like be useful in some real life applications and at least real time applications where the transform models, they are very, very complex and, and they're also fairly slow. So for the input here, we basically just have the size of the channels and also the samples. And then we're just flattering that out into a single like vector, throwing it through this MLP. So let's look at some of the comparisons now. So now we're introduced like all the mod methods I've gone into like the theory behind the transform model and also the specific architecture that I've been using with the transformer. So let's now take a look at the results where we're basically just going to cover like all of it. So we have the window duration. We, I'm testing out different parameters for the window duration. So this is basically the window duration that we can see here. 
it was also possible to have a delay. So like how much we actually want to delay our window duration before starting the recording. Um, so basically like if we had a window delay of 200, that will be 200 milliseconds. So we actually like start the recording like 200 milliseconds before the signal, just to include that data as well. Maybe it was containing some um, important information. But here we can see that the best performing model parameters were actually, were actually like the longest window duration and also with zero delay, which, which kind of makes sense because then we'll have more data to a transformer model. It has more data to actually like learn from and also do prediction from, but it doesn't really decrease that much by actually like going down to like a window duration of 390 milliseconds. Then I pretty, pretty much done, done it on both data sets. For, so this is both for like 10 samples and also 30 samples. So this is the number of bins that we're actually like dividing our time window into. So here we have 10 samples, here we have 30 samples. So the more samples we have, the more information the model has to actually like make the predictions, which again, which makes kind of sense. So this is the best results that I actually like got. So this was also what we saw in the abstract. Did the exact same thing for the visual cue data set which has like significantly lower validation accuracy compared to on the movement data set could be explained by the data set analysis that I did in the start and also the tension scores where the visual cue data set just doesn't contain as much information compared to the movement data set, which also makes sense because we are looking at these like motor brain regions comparing to a transformer with the old school methods. So we have the weighted transformer. I'll just zoom in here a bit so you guys can better see what's going on. So we have the weighted transformer basically just a single encoder for the, the channel wise information still achieves pretty good accuracy, but we see that the best accuracy is still like our, our weighted transformer. So this was the single encoder. This weighted transformer was without an auto encoder and this is with an auto encoder. Then we can see for the visual cue data set where we had like a lot more noise, act like using the auto encoder, increase the results. But if we're looking down here with our movement data set, which was containing more information and also the tension maps were act like pretty good. Then we can see that it, it is not really like beneficial to add an auto encoder, which also makes sense if you think about it. We have the single encoder transformer, also pretty good results, but not as good as the weighted transformer. I know that it is kind of like double the complexity by adding another um, another like encoder block where the information or like the input input information is act like overlapping a lot. Then we have the LCM model just not good at all. And then we also just have the standard MLP, which acts like performs pretty good. We can see that we get around like 70, 78% uh, accuracy on the validation set, where we get like around 83.5 validation accuracy for a weighted transformer. And this MLP model is very, very simple. So yeah, we can actually go in and do this decoding of the monkey actions performed, but only using this standard MLP model. You won't get as good accuracy here. Again, we can also increase the accuracy by doing like more modifications, train on more data, try to reduce the, the day to day variations and so on, test different subsets of the data set. Um, so we can do like a lot more for future work, but we can see we get the best validation accuracy with the transformer model, but it is still acceptable with this MLP model. Um, which is very low complexity. Then I've tested the individual brain regions where we can see that for the visual data set, there's actually like a difference in the brain regions. The PRR region by itself, it doesn't really achieve good accuracy where the M1 region is basically what contains most information and we get the highest accuracy on the M1 region, even though we're looking at the visual data set. And if we're looking at the movement data set, we get way better performance on the M1 region. In general, all the accuracies here are higher on the movement data set compared to the visual data set, which was also the case in all the other test results. But we can also see here like the PRR region, which is for like initiating movements and act like just performing movements as well, planning movements. It has way higher accuracy compared to the visual queue. So here we have 67 and up here we had 50, 53. So this is actually like a civic significantly like upgrade. And this is kind of like the most interesting results from this individual brain region test together with that the M1 region act like contains the most information and achieves the highest accuracy in both cases and acts like 4% more than the second best brain region. So now let's talk about like discussions, future work, let's just scroll through it. And, and here I'm basically just discussing like what could be done in project 
uh, what could be improved, like how can we get this closer to like real real life human machine brain interfaces and also just like discussing it back and forth, also looking into some of the news research. So some of the news research is actually like pretty interesting as well, where they use like brain recordings from human brain as well, where they're using like a functional MRI, where they scan the brain, it is still like just recording the brain signals or like the neurons. Uh, the signals from the neurons, but then we can actually go in and reconstruct like images and even like high quality images and actually generate videos based on those images. So basically recording the brain data, extracting the information, and then just like having this AI generated art where they try to like reconstruct um, the brain signals from the visual brain regions. So that is some of the most interesting research going on right now basically just using like machine brain interfaces. There's also a lot of research going into the recording devices of the human brain um, and also just monkey brain. And also just using the fusion models for like generating images, um, getting better like data, also making the data like better. So we get better generalization of the models by using these new diffusion models, which is used in a lot of like generative AI right now. Talking about uh, the improvements and the data set limitations as well before going on to future work. So what could be done for future work? We talked about that slightly going off over this report, um, but basically just to like look into better generalization so we can try to like reduce the day-to-day -day variability even more and reduce the overfitting. Also just look into like having more data, creating subsets of the data, try to like play around with it, do some post-processing and pre-processing. Uh, the data set here was very limited, so not much could be done. And also just like focus on optimizing the models, keep making the models better, and also just developing developing in towards like real world usage with focus on real-time performance. If we're talking about like real-time performance, we would probably like prefer the MLP over the transform model because it is just like way faster and way more simple compared to like the complex transform model. There's also a lot of research going into like the transform models, like how they could be optimized and so on. They are basically like the state of the art in most domains out there now, if not all domains. So then we have the conclusion here again. It is kind of the same as the abstract. So we won't really like dive into details with that. It is just a bit more detailed compared to the abstract. We just cover like all of the points and also a bit more like quantitative results. I also have the references here that I've been using throughout the report, both for the theory, some of the models, the comparisons, and also just for day to day and the theory behind like neural activity and what of what, what are like, like the nearest research going on both for um, decoding brain recordings, trying to like reconstruct images based on brain recordings and neural activity as well. So this is basically like all the resources that I've been using throughout my um, math thesis, the project that I've done, and also the report here at the end. So I hope you guys have learned a ton from going through this math thesis, both on uh, like a technical point and also just how can you write a math thesis, bachelor thesis, the final project, get some inspiration for that. Maybe you can use some of these things here on your own for your own project. So thank you guys for watching this video here. Remember to subscribe button and bell notification under video so you get a notification when I upload the next video. So I hope to see you in that video guys. Bye for now.